Okay, hello everyone. This is Kevin Lagore with Skywatcher USA, and welcome to our first webcast. We're going to try to do this every Friday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. and see what we can get out of it. I know a lot of people are stuck at home at the moment, so it's uh, kind of an interesting situation. But uh, we're going to try to make the best of it, and we figured this live stream would be a cool way to get things going. See what you guys want to learn, if there's anything about products you might want to learn, and each episode moving forward, we're hoping that we can streamline something for everyone and uh, learn something new. So if you have any questions about any Skywatcher products, uh, let us know. Uh, there is a chat there uh, down below. You can ask questions there. I'll try to answer anything that you might need. Uh, what we're really looking for today is ideas and things that you might want to learn because as we move forward on different episodes through the next couple weeks, we're going to try and do really specific uh, webcasts. So if you have an interest on Star Adventure or filters or setting up for astrophotography or anything of that nature, we can try to do specific topics for each morning so uh, we want to get some ideas from you guys and hopefully start doing this weekly so again if you have any questions uh, you can post that over in our live chat over here I'd be happy to answer anything you might have we'll kind of keep it generic today as kind of a basic Q&A but anything with products or astronomy or anything that you might have I'll be happy to answer what I can and then, of course, moving forward over the next couple of weeks, we're going to try to make sure every episode is a little bit more specific. And uh, let's see. There will be a little bit of tech issues today because we are just getting some stuff figured out here. So, so bear with us. We are still here. Uh, we're just trying to figure out some live chat issues. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, just let us know. Um, the comments should be working down below. But yeah, we're just trying to get some of the tech stuff figured out here. There we go. Thank you, Carol. Uh, so yeah, the chat seems to be working now. Be happy to answer any questions you guys have. Again, this is just kind of our first episode If you can't see the chat, refresh your windows real quick and it should pop up there. Now the Linda, you can actually email us at support at skywatcherusa.com. That's the best way to get a hold of us, especially right now with everything going on. 
But um, if you just kind of let us know what's going on with your stuff, we can kind of get an answer and see how we can get your EQ6R issue addressed. Again, today's just kind of a general Q&A. Um, if you have ideas that you want us to cover in the future, then let us know. We'll be happy to do future episodes on very specific things. And hopefully over the next couple of weeks, we can... While a lot of us are stuck at home, we can still have kind of an astronomy community and encourage each other to go outside and explore our hobby, even though the world's a little strange right now. Lauren, the Esprit 120s and the Esprit 150s are all pretty much fabricated in the same way. And there's no real difference between them other than obviously the physical size of them but there shouldn't be any changes coming to those it's not something that we we like doing you know if we have a product that we know is good then it's kind of if it ain't broke don't fix it kind of mentality uh, if there are issues that we will address it uh, especially with the engineers and the factory but for the most point um, there are no changes to the Esprit line other than the, the cosmetic branding changes that we've done where we added the green signatures, um, but that's just a branding and cosmetic thing. But um, the only thing that, it's not a change, the only thing that people have been asking for on the Esprits for a long time have been a focal reducer, and we worked with Star Arizona in Tucson, Arizona, and they actually designed what's called the Apex ED reducer, and it's a 0.65x reducer for that that works on the Esprits. Uh, as far as weight goes, there's there hasn't really been any reduction on that. They're all still using the same metal tubes. Um, so yeah, there's no no big changes have been done on the Esprits um, at this time. And as far as I know, there are no changes coming to the Esprits moving forward. But thanks all for the questions, Jeff. I'm glad you're uh, enjoying the mount. Uh, we've got always got new stuff in the pipeline. We're really excited. Hopefully later this year we'll have some other stuff coming out to show. Um, of course, we were all expecting to go to Neef. Uh, the beginning of April and due to all the fun stuff going on in the world that has been postponed till the fall so we're planning to be there later in the year and we are planning to take place in their uh, live video setup that they will be doing uh, the Saturday of Neef or that was originally going to be so we are planning to do that as well but in the meantime, we want to start doing these weekly webcasts. Uh, this is our first one, obviously, so thanks for everyone who's kind of tuned in. Uh, our plan is to do these from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Pacific time over the next couple weeks and hopefully have each episode be tuned to something fairly specific. Um, we get a lot of questions and we're kind of hoping that these webcasts, while everybody's kind of stuck at home, will allow us to learn and kind of explore things. So we want to get ideas for future episodes and topics uh, and just try to keep the community alive even though everyone's staying away from one another. We can still enjoy the hobby. And astronomy is one of those unique hobbies that you can do from your house. You don't need to do it in a large group. Uh, it's fun if you can, obviously, but it is something that can be done from home as long as it's clear, the stars in the sky are not going anywhere anytime soon. So going out, using your telescope, and kind of exploring uh, from your backyard is a good way to keep yourself grounded and keep yourself rooted while we all kind of go through this strange time together. So um, now's a good time to be interested in amateur astronomy. Uh, so just hope for clear skies. And then if you can get out to dark skies, that's always helpful as well. Um, many locations you can still get to. But for today, it's just going to kind of be a general Q&A. We're pretty much open to whatever uh, questions you might have, whether it's astronomy or products or 
try to tell you what I can. Um, some future episodes we'll probably be talking about some new stuff that's coming out, but we want to make sure we get a little bit closer to um, the Neath event. So, but yeah, please feel free to ask whatever's on your mind. I will try to answer what I can within reason, of course. But we do appreciate you guys hanging in there with us and being part of the Skywatcher family and team. Hey Jerry, uh, yeah, so there's a couple different comets that are obviously fairly visible. Uh, the big one is C2019Y4, um, or Atlas. Uh, it was mid-February when this started to come up, and it looks like it'll be reaching perihelion on the 30th. Uh, there's actually a really good website for comets. Um, here, I'll put it over here. This is called cometchasing.skyhound.com. Let me see if I can get my display out of the way. If not, uh, we'll work on that. But yeah, right up here is what you are looking for. Sorry, my display is in the way. So we'll adjust that in the future. But uh, Comet Chasing, uh, this is a nice website that you can go to to see what stuff is up. And it has all the details uh, further down. And that's something that we can all check out uh, moving forward, if you're looking for comets, uh, this is a great website for all that. Let's see what else is on the docket here. Hey Carol, yeah, we've we've actually talked about doing uh, live stacking. Um, it's probably going to be something I'll be doing through my own outreach program called Focus Astronomy, since it takes place in the evenings. Um, but we'll we'll look into doing that. But we do have the setup. This is kind of a trial run, working on the broadcasting capabilities, but. We, we certainly can hook up a telescope and do some live live star parties online. So that'll probably be something over the next week or two that I try to refine. So it is something that I definitely want to do. Uh, the Integra refractors those, as far as I know, are still on the design board at the moment. I have yet to see one. 
um, in person, even at the factory, we weren't able to see any. So they're not quite ready yet. And I'm not sure when we're going to expect to see them. Uh, there are some new things as far as scopes that you'll probably see in the next couple weeks, I'm hoping. Um, but at the moment, the Integras are not on um, the docket at the moment. Now, over the last uh, year, Skywatcher here in the U.S. has released a, a couple new products here that we can kind of go over really quick. If I can get my display to work. So one of the one of the new products that got added this year is the Solar Quest. Now the Solar Quest is kind of based upon our AZ GTI. Uh, it's a real small little compact mount. Uh, this rides on the same chassis, but the cool thing about the Solar Quest mount is it's actually designed to track the sun. So you simply set up your telescope with the correct solar filter or with the filter of choice. Um, it works really good with, you know, any of the hydrogen alpha telescopes up to 60 millimeter from any, any manufacturer, uh, you know, Coronado, Lunt, Daystar, um, all of them are excellent. Uh, but up to their 60 millimeter models, or even up to some of the 80 millimeter models, the Solar Quest works quite well. Um, for that. So you set it up, uh, make sure you've got batteries or use the included uh, 12 volt plate that powers the, the mount there with your own battery and turn it on. And the mount has a built in GPS, it auto levels itself. And then the solar sensor, which you can see right up in here, that uh, will locate the sun. And this will hold up to about 10 pounds payload capacity. So anything up to about that point. As long as you have the correct solar filter on there, cannot stress that enough that you have the correct solar filter there, this will find and track the sun. And it's a great little mount. And if you're if you're going to do some solar eclipse chasing, the cool thing about this is you don't actually need to use the tripod that we include. You could take the mount head off and mount it to your favorite photo head at that point and check it out um, that way, uh, being that it's really small. So that's the Solar Quest. Um, another one that did get released last year that a lot of people haven't been seeing is the AZ GTE. The AZ GTE is kind of the watered down version, if you will, of our really popular AZ GTI. Uh, the AZ GTE does not feature the freedom find capability where you can disengage the clutch and move it around manually. It's still a go-to mount, but it does not have the ability to disengage clutches and uh, you manually move it around. And for most people, that's probably fine because you wouldn't actually be taking the... Uh, a lot of people don't end up manually moving things around. So uh, the AZ GTEs are they're actually available right now they're the same setup it looks exactly like an az gti uh, holds the same amount of weight but uh you can get it mount only or we sell it with our two little acromatic star travels the 80 millimeter f5 and a 102 f f5 and those are both acromats uh, the 80 millimeter has an inch and a quarter focuser comes with an inch and a quarter star diagonal, a 25 and a 10 millimeter inch and a quarter eyepiece. And the 102, the 102 actually has a two inch focuser. Uh, it ha comes with inch and a quarter accessories, but it does have a two inch focuser, so you can use larger hardware on there. 
and that's the AZGTE series. So uh, that's another new one that got announced last year. Now, another new product that has also been announced is the EvoStar 72 ED Reducer Corrector Adapter. Now, what this allows you to do is use our EvoStar 80.85X Reducer, and this allows you to adapt it to the Evo 72 focuser because the threading situation is a little bit different on the 72. Um, with this adapter, you can actually thread a two inch filter in the bottom portion inside. You can't see the threads in here, but a two inch filter will thread in there. This would thread onto the back of the Evo Star 72 focuser, replacing the visual back um, inside of it. So you can actually adjust the orientation of your camera easily without having to unthread anything and there's a set of captured threads in there so it will not drop out. You actually have to pull and unthread it as well in order for that. Now we do plan to offer one of these adapters coming soon for the larger models, the 80, 100, 120, and 150 standard, not the DX, uh, different focuser there. So that is the uh, reducer corrector adapter for the 72. If you've got an EvoStar 72, you can use our 0.85X reducer flattener on that and speed that up to F4.9, I think is what that comes out to. U8R uh, series. Now the EQ8R uh, replaces the old EQ8 that so many were familiar with and basically completely redesigns the mount altogether. Uh, the EQ8R and RH are the two models. You can get them in full mount setup with a portable pier or you can get them with the mount head by itself if you're putting it in an observatory because this mount does hold 110 pounds, which is about 50 kilos. Uh, it can handle some really serious scope hardware. And that that works out really well for a lot of people. Uh, this is belt drive on both axes. The original EQ8 was only belt drive on the right ascension, but not the deck. So the belt drive reduces the amount of gears that are being used, and that reduces the amount of backlash in a system. So uh, that's one big adjustment. Uh, we did remove the freedom find capability from this. I know some people uh, were not happy about that, but this is a observatory grade mount. You're gonna put some really heavy scopes on here, like a 14 inch Macassa grain or one of our Quattro 12s, 300 Ps, uh, big, big scopes. So we found that for the most part, you don't really want to be disengaging the clutches and manually moving some stuff around with a mount this big. Uh, it still has the go-to in there, 42,000 object database. Uh, the big thing for the imagers, though, is this has a through mount cabling uh, hub system, which you can kind of see right in here. Uh, these are four USB 3.0 hubs. They are not powered. Uh, but there are four 3.0s and you can plug all your cameras and filter wheels and stuff in the hub. And then that comes out to one nice cable out the back to plug into your computer. We also have four 2.1 millimeter uh, power plugs up here that can be run off of one power plug back down here. I usually recommend the Celestron a 5 amp AC adapter if you're working from home plug that into that power port you can run a slew of different uh, products off of that uh, I run my CCD power off of that um, and then the filter wheel and all comes with that so that is the the EQ8R um, we've also moved the motor positions the original EQ8 didn't have great balance because the motors were on the side of the head so it would pull the mount to one side. And the engineers have removed this and uh, put the motors uh, more inside and on the, the center portion of the mount so it balances better. Uh, so there's that as well. 
and that's the EQ8R. Now the EQ8R and the RH are the exact same mount except that the RH has a on-axis Renshaw encoder, 11 million tick on-axis encoder on the right ascension. And it, that's really the only place you need to have a high accuracy encoder because the right ascension is the one doing most of the guiding when you're imaging. And what an on-axis encoder does as opposed to these have stepper motors in them so that it reads the steps. Uh, an on-axis encoder will see if there's any leave way um, in the motor speeding up too fast and tracking and makes those fine adjustments there. Um, so it really gives you a, a excellent guide curve. For most people, the seeing conditions will not actually support the amount of guiding that you can get off of the RH. Um, it's so accurate that when you're guiding and everything is set up correctly that your limiting factor is going to be the seeing conditions that your guide scope and guide camera are able to resolve. And for most people shooting in their backyard that's probably going to be somewhere between 1 and 2 arc seconds. Uh, probably more like 1.5 to 2 arc seconds or wherever. So it, it's very very rare to get to, to 1. The seeing's got to be great and then sub arc second seeing course that's like the observatories now we do have an optional polar scope if you want one and extra counterweights if needed but that is the R and RH series and those are those are currently available as well and that's for the most part that's pretty much it at the moment for 2019 releases um, there is some new stuff coming for 2020 um, we'll probably be doing an episode on that in the near future so just keep an eye out. If you like what we're doing today, please come back and join us. We're going to try to do this 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. every Friday for the next foreseeable future. Just, just for something to do and kind of keep the community going because we all can't be around each other at the moment. Uh, this kind of lets us keep in touch and be social and learn some stuff. So if there's something that you actually want to see, uh, let us know. And we'll do an episode on that in the future. Uh, there was a question in here. Minos, Minya, sorry for butchering your name. I apologize. Uh, the Esprit 80, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Yes, I, I actually would agree that I'm not a fan of the mounting foot on the Esprit 80. I would much rather it have rings or a clamshell. We did discuss this with the factory. And it it just didn't pan out. We were hoping it would, but it for so the 80 unfortunately does have a mounting foot. I have had customers take the mounting foot off and put rings on it, but um, yeah, I don't have a I don't have a real clean option for anything for that. So, but if you can get around that, the 80 is a very nice scope. Uh, Jerry, I, I don't have any examples at the moment of a 0.63 uh, reducer on a Mac. I know on the 127, the 150, and the 180, they do have Schmidt Cassegrain threads on the rear cell, so you could use a, a Celestron 0.63 reducer on those Macs. And it does work. I've visually tried it. Uh, but I don't have any photographic examples of one, and I don't currently have a 0.63x reducer uh, in my inventory of stuff at the moment to try that and test that out. But I will see what we can do in the future on that. Maybe we can do a video on Max in the future if people want to see that. So something to think about. If, if you guys are enjoying this webcast, you can email us at support at skywatcherusa.com and let us know what you think. If there's something you want us to cover, then let us know. We, we want to keep doing episodes like this every Friday, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Pacific time, and hopefully we can do different topics um, each week. Uh, the more specific, the better, because I can do some research on that. If you want to know about optics, if you want to know about picking filters or matching your camera, or even observing ideas uh, for objects that are up this time of year. So while we're all stuck at home, we can still go out and view some, some different things. And then we are gonna look into doing those digital star parties, uh, live star parties, so we can all uh, 
check out some objects live off of a telescope. Now that we've got this uh, webcast thing figured out, uh, we already have the telescope stuff figured out, so we just have to plug the two together. That should be the easy part, and we can do kind of a an evening star party, so stay tuned for, for that as well. We're going to try to to do something like that. That would actually be kind of cool. So. Um, we are looking into the PSD line. For those of you who don't know, those are our F5 Newtonians. They come in 130, 150, so 5 inch, 6 inch, 8 inch, 10 inch. They do make a 12 inch as well, but it would be a very large tube. Uh, we are looking into that. I would really like to bring the 130 in. It's such an awesome little telescope. Uh, it's a basically an F5, or yeah, PDS which stands for uh, Parabolic Dual Speed Focuser. And uh, we are looking into bringing those in. I'm hoping once all the mess that's going around right now levels out that we can kind of get back into filling out the lineup a little bit more. But we, we are looking into it, uh, particularly on the small ones. The problem with a lot of the standard Newtonians is we do have our Quattro F4s, and those are generally more popular for astrophotography purposes, obviously. And those people who are wanting to use a Newtonian, they, they'd rather go with a Dobsonian. Uh, there are some people that want to still use them on equatorials. It's just the inconvenience of having to rotate the tube gets difficult. Um, so we have looked at bringing the, the PDS line in or the F5 Newtonians. It's just not something at the moment that's that's occurring. But obviously there's a lot of stuff going on that's mixing up some of our standard day-to-day -day. so we're trying to keep Skywatcher um, North America going here and you know hopefully we can uh, level all that out and continue on but our support is still opened um, you can still call in uh, we're still doing repairs and shipping stuff when we can but yeah we're we're hanging in there so hopefully after this you'll see some more new stuff and maybe the PDS line so thanks for the question there if you guys are just tuning in this is our first episode of our webcast series we're hoping to do this every Friday 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Pacific time and we're hoping that each episode will be geared towards something specific uh, today's just kind of a general Q&A but if you have thoughts or want wanting something for us to research like you want to match your pixels to your camera you want to know about filters or telescopes or something specific then let us know you can also email us at support at skywatcherusa.com and let us know what you want to learn about and we'll try to do like a dedicated episode to that as well um, but we appreciate everyone kind of tuning in right now and being a part of it so Let's see, while well, we're hanging around. Oh, um. Where are we going with this? So, for those who don't know, a lot of people actually don't, but we do have a, a SynScan Wi Fi adapter that's actually available it's been available for a while but if you want to actually do a wireless 
connection and run it off of your phone, you can actually plug our SynScan Wi-Fi directly into that and replace the hand controller for wireless control using our SynScan Pro app. Uh, we do have a lot of people who ask this to work on Sky Safari um, at the moment. They are still working on the development on that side. Um, but there is another app called Luminos that does work on one device and can be controlled on the SynScan Wi-Fi. And uh, we've been playing with that and it does work quite well. So uh, Luminos is the name of that app. If you want to mess with that, it works on the SynScan Wi-Fi as well as all of our Wi-Fi based uh, telescopes, which include the AZGTIs, AZGTEs, and now our uh, collapsible DOBs, our FlexTube SynScan DOBs actually have Wi-Fi built into them now. So something to check out. Uh, that'd be our FlexTube SynScans that are actually on sale this month, but they have built-in Wi-Fi control now. So that's something to, to check out moving forward. If you're interested in getting some large aperture, that's the way to go. So, Linda, I'm not sure if the uh, SynScan adapter can be used on EQMod. I don't use EQMod. It's not something that we test with here. Um, but I believe you might be able to get it to work. How that would run, though, is you have to have SynScan Pro for PC downloaded on your computer, and then I think you'd have to route EQMod somehow through that. So it kind of works as like a virtual hand controller, if you will. But that would be something that you'd have to to try out. It's it's just not something that we've tested here. There's so many third-party softwares out there that it makes it really difficult for us to to stay up and play with. I know EQ Mod for us is one of the more popular of the bunch from our customers, but it's it's just not something that we've had a chance to to really play with at the moment. So but uh it would be worth an experiment, uh, especially considering that a lot of us are stuck at home at the moment. So something worth trying out and uh maybe we can see if we can get that to work or not I, there should be a way to do it i'm just not aware of aware of it off the top of my head at the moment but that is a good question if you're just joining us this is our first webcast episode it is taking place 10 a.m to 11 a.m on fridays we're kind of today's kind of a general Q and A, but if there's specific topics that you want us to cover, we'll be doing that moving forward on each episode. Uh, if you want to shoot your question over to us, you can do that at support at skywatchusa.com, or uh, you can shoot it over in the live chat section right there, and we'll we'll take some notes down and do all of that in the future. So. I'm glad you're enjoying your Evo Guide 50. It works great as a guider, but it also works great as a tiny little astrograph. Um, if you're not aware and you own a Evo uh, 50, as we call them, you can use that little telescope as a an astrograph, thanks to uh, the guys over at Star Arizona. They have actually made what's called the Evo FF, and that is a tiny little field flattener for the the Evo Guide 50 and it turns the the 50 the Evo Guide 50 into a, a tiny little flat field 50 millimeter astrograph and it works pretty darn well actually um, we have one and it's it's pretty impressive for a tiny a tiny little refractor but you could you could mount that on like a star adventure or a tiny tiny little um, equatorial of some kind and do some pretty nice little imaging with it and uh, it's a it's a pretty awesome little combo so if you're looking for a really tiny little arrangement the the Evo guide 50 paired with the star zone field flattener works really well I believe it has an APS-C crop sensor illuminated field you'd have to check with star Arizona on that but um, we have one it works really nicely especially if you're looking for a small little small little imaging system 
and uh, they actually even make a tiny little Bantanoff mask uh, for the 50 as well. So Star Zone has been making all kinds of little accessories um, for that. They actually make a tiny little 3D printed clamshell, and it's it's a cool little accessory. So just ask them about that. But that those are some accessories for the Evo Guy 50. If you want to turn it into an actual tiny little telescope, uh, basically it's a 242 millimeter. I think that comes out to f4.8. I have to do the math on that real quick. Um, but yes, about f4.8. Yeah, 4.84. Uh, flat field astrograph and it weighs absolutely nothing so uh, something to check out if you're looking for something really tiny uh, that would be the way to go is the evo guide with the evo ff flattener and uh, you can check that out star zone is supposed to be getting more of them in stock um, but yeah just keep an eye on it it would be something cool so the chromatic aberration on that should be fairly reduced um, you might get some color on it because it's a doublet but it's still much better corrected than the the cheaper achromatic guide scopes that you find from some other places being that it is an ed doublet so it it is a nice little telescope uh, unfortunately it doesn't work well for for visual purposes but 50 would be really quite tiny for a lot of visual work our 72 evo star would be uh, really works really well actually we had one out last night on venus and it does quite well um, especially with high power eyepieces you'll still get a little bit of color because it is a doublet but it holds really well for what it is but if you're if you're in the chat right now or do you have a question just let us know we're just doing a basic Q&A session today about pretty much anything that you can pop into your mind uh, I'll try to answer it to the best of my abilities and products whatever whatever you're looking for uh, we'll try to go over it even astronomy related stuff it doesn't have to be products but we'd be happy to kind of go over different things moving forward so don't feel feel free to just type it into live chat or if you want us to cover a certain topic moving into the future episodes just let us know and uh, we'll we'll be posting about what's going what's going on in the the future episodes so you can join us but you can uh, keep an eye out on our social media like our Facebook page and our Instagram pages and we'll be posting whatever's up uh, for the next episode we'll tell you what's going on and we'll probably have an episode for some 2020 new product announcements coming up there's there's a handful of them and uh, we, we were hoping to show a lot of that stuff off at Neef but obviously with everything going on Neef is not occurring at the moment it's been postponed until fall but that still means we can announce some of our our other products um, so keep an eye on that I'm sure we'll be doing a video on that We'll take a look at making that big laser for you. Lasers are really tough to actually work with because you have so many restrictions um, on things. I'd love to have a, a clear sky laser. That'd be awesome to get some of those clouds out of the way. But uh, in all reality, yeah, lasers just in general, I, I know this was supposed to be fun, but while we're on the topic, lasers can be really, really difficult to actually work with because of obviously them being having their limitations on it but yes if we could get an awesome cloud laser to remove clouds that would be sweet Jerry's got a good question. 
Um, if someone wants to try astrophotography but keep it simple and cheap, what would you recommend? So astrophotography is really kind of a difficult balancing act, especially when it comes to budget. Um, normally we joke about uh, budget friendly and astrophotography generally don't blend well in the same sentence. That's getting better. Um, the biggest thing I find for people getting into astrophotography is they don't want to put the time or have the patience to really, really dial in a system because it does take time. But if you're just getting started, I think the best way to do it is with a star adventurer. I think the best way to get into astrophotography is with a star adventurer, which is the small little tracking mounts that we offer. Uh, they're just a little right ascension drive mount, but a lot of people already have like a DSLR, like a Canon, a Nikon, Sony, Olympus, Fuji, you know, all the, all the major cameras. A lot of people have a basic camera at home that will already do a really nice job, and they've probably got some lenses that are available too. So using that equipment is a good way to start. Um, or just getting out to a dark sky and understanding how to take low light uh, images on a tripod. And then you could move over to the Star Adventurer trackers, which will help you get longer exposures. And that'll allow you to learn how to do polar alignment and getting familiar with how to work a mount uh, for astrophotography. But the, the biggest thing that people need to understand when they're moving into astrophotography is it, it's going to take some time. It's going to have a learning curve to it. Uh, it's, it can, it's, it's, co it's a complicated setup, but you can do it. It's just it's going to take some time. But starting basic on a star adventure is a good way to go. Uh, we have a lot of customers that like to go from 0 to 60, and that's totally fine. But you want to become familiar with your system and the sky and some people uh, try to digest too much at once so you know jumping in with a go-to mount and a big refractor and a camera with a monochrome sensor and filters and a guider and and all the software to run that that gets really complicated really quick so something small like a star adventure allows you to kind of get the basic concepts down polar alignment how to point your stuff how to stack and start processing and then from there you could upgrade to like a go-to mount and maybe a telescope or using a larger lens like a 400 or 500 or 600 millimeter and using it on that and then moving forward from there and kind of slowly pulling all that together into a, a larger more complex uh, imaging system and the nice thing about these is they're they're fairly inexpensive and uh, Linda brings up a good situation there that there's a lot of decent books out there that will help simplify, or not simplify, but give you a better understanding of the things that you're gonna need to know for astrophotography. And again, it's gonna take time. I, I don't wanna discourage anybody from astronomy or astrophotography because it's an awesome hobby, especially in the day and age right now, but it's it is something that you will take time and now we all have time so uh just take some time and dig into that minos uh pro apologies if i butcher the name again uh i'd have to look that up i i don't know for the eqm 35 i think it shares almost the same gearing on the right ascension for the eq5 but uh i i don't know off the top of my head for the the worm cycle uh for that mount at the moment so We've got about 10 minutes left, so if you're just joining us, the way today has been working is this is our first webcast episode. We plan to do this on Fridays, 11 a.m., I'm sorry, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Pacific time, and just for an hour. And we want to cover different topics in astronomy or equipment, and we want to get ideas from what you want to learn about. 
or check out. So um, we'll probably do a, uh, an episode coming up about some of the new products for 2020. Uh, we have a handful of them that are coming out and we were hoping to have those at NEF uh, the first weekend of April, but obviously with everything going on at the moment, no one's going anywhere and NEF has been postponed till the fall. Uh, so we need to tell people about this stuff. So one of the episodes coming up and we'll let you guys know on our social media accounts what each episode is probably going to be aimed at, but today is just testing and seeing what people are looking for. So you can either let us know in the the stream over there, the live chat on what you'd like to know about, or you can email your idea to support at skywatcherusa.com and we'll be uh, happy to come up with an episode. But uh, they'll probably be related mostly towards Skywatcher equipment and some more uh, basics of astronomy. And... That's something that we'd like to keep doing. And then, of course, uh, we would like to start doing some digital star parties where we actually do live feeds off the telescope. So uh, we'll work on that and hopefully start doing that over the next couple of weeks. Linda, we are planning to be at the fall uh, NEF show. Uh, we love going to NEF. We weren't really too pleased that it was postponed, but it's unfortunately it's it's a situation that's out of everybody's hands at the moment so we are hoping that we can be there we are planning on being there so um, if you're there we hope to see you there uh, we will be as far as i know we are participating in the virtual NEF. i'm not sure exactly how that's all going to come together yet but um, our plan is to be a part of it so. Which Dobsonian telescope do you think is the most beginner one? Uh, one person to handle. The uh, the nice thing about the Dobbs is they can split them from their bases. So the tube actually pulls out of the base and can be can be used anywhere. Um, you just take the base, put that in the car, put the tube in the car. Um, Probably for one person, I'm a big fan of our Flex Tube 300. Uh, this would be my pick for one person. Uh, a 300 millimeter or 12 inch packs a ton of punch for the nighttime sky. Um, you are basically getting down to magnitude 14.9, 15th magnitude. So there's a lot of stuff on a star chart and uh, star maps that you can get to with a 12 inch, especially under dark skies. So if you can swing budget wise a 12 inch, I would go with the 12. It's got 44% more light than a 10 inch does. So that, that is considerable, um, especially in a dark sky. But I think 12 is a sweet number. It's not too big, it's not too small, um, but you are getting into a size where galaxies and details and galaxies tend to pop in a 12 inch just because you're starting to really dig into the sky with a scope that size um, if that's a little too big then you could step down to the 250s which is the 10 inch and we make those in the collapsible or flex tube models or if you want simplicity you can go to our classic uh, 250s which um, are very very simple scopes you know standard daub just a base and a tube and those work really well. They're they're fairly lightweight. Uh, so those would be my two picks. If a 10 or 12 inch, ideally, an 8 inch is very nice too. Uh, it just depends on how much you want to lug around um, for you. So if you can handle a larger scope, then moving to a 10 or a 12 inch it was, would be my personal pick. Um, if those were going to be a little too much, then getting an 8 inch or 200 millimeter uh, would be would be nice uh, we do make 150 millimeter that's it's really lightweight it's an awesome little telescope um, but I, I I've always liked aperture I I love large telescopes so bigger the better uh, for me but the best scope that you're gonna get is the one that you use the most so make sure it's something that if you're if you're gonna get out and you're gonna use it then that would be the way to go so that would be my recommendation on that 
we've got a few minutes left. Um, if you want to get your questions in uh, last minute, we'll be happy to answer what we've got. And um, be happy to answer any final questions. And then we will be back uh, next Friday, 10 a.m., uh, right here on our Skywatcher channel. And be another hour conversation and live chat and i think next week we're going to try to do something geared specifically towards a particular product unless we get some cool ideas but we'll post on our social media accounts what uh, episode two is going to be and um, we'll be looking forward to getting any ideas from from any of you guys moving forward you can also email your thoughts and ideas to support at skywatcherusa.com and uh, we'll we'll take it from there. And we will be working on some digital star party stuff uh, that might be through uh, an outreach program. But we'll be we'll discuss that this week and see what we can do on that. And we'll let people know that uh, where to go and what we're going to be doing for that. But again, we understand everyone's kind of stuck at home. It's a little strange right now. So that's why we thought the webcast would be kind of fun because we can talk shop, we can talk astronomy, and even though we can't be around with each other right now we can still keep the conversation and the community going and get through this whole thing and probably hopefully continue the webcast uh, moving beyond that. So this is just to kind of get us through the motions at the moment, but moving forward, it could be something cool. It could be something fun um, for all of us to do on a weekly basis for just learning all kinds of stuff. Uh, so if you have any final questions, we've got a couple minutes left. I'd be happy to answer what you guys need or what you guys have. Um, but for those of you who've been here, thanks for tuning in for the first one and putting up with some of our technical issues in the beginning. Uh, it's been pretty fun. And uh, we hope to continue this uh, each week, Friday, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. in the future. And we'll try to maybe do some guest stuff too. Uh, we're still working on some of the Technic stuff, but I, I think there's ways that we can maybe get a couple guests on here too. Got some cool friends of ours. And uh, with the ability of the internet and technology, we can reach reach out and see who we can bring on too. So, But uh, if that's it, thank you all for tuning in today. Uh, join us next week. Uh, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Pacific time right here on the Skywatcher channel here on YouTube. And we'll be going over some other cool stuff next week. So much appreciated for everyone being here. And we will catch you next week. Take care and be safe.